Germany is electing a new parliament and thereby indirectly a new chancellor today. Why these two are closely related, how the election works and what happens after today, I'll explain in this video. Hello, servus and welcome back to my YouTube channel. My name is Felicia, I'm originally from Munich, Germany, but I've been living here in Cincinnati, Ohio on and off since 2016. So today is the day that Germany and many other countries in the world have been anticipating for a while now, because this isn't just any election, this is going to be the election where we'll pick our new chancellor who will replace Angela Merkel. Merkel has been in office for almost 16 years at this point, since 2005, which is when I was 11 years old. And when she announced that she wasn't going to run again for the next term, Germany had a lot of question marks as to who her successor might be. And let's say it was a pretty wild ride for the different parties to nominate their top candidates. And even after they were nominated, things have been turbulent. Now, it's always a different thing to observe an election from the sidelines, if you will, from another country. So even though I'm not currently in Germany, most of the media I consume about the election and just in general about German domestic politics is German media, which wouldn't be possible without one of my most loyal companions of the last few years, ExpressVPN. They're actually sponsoring this video, so a big shout out to them. With ExpressVPN, I can change my online location so it appears like I'm accessing the web from another country. So when I set my location to Germany, I can access things like live TV reports, like the ones on the election results today, or or on-demand clips from German TV channels that are usually geo-blocked for me when I'm here in the US. But not only do I use it to catch up with politics, it also allows me to watch some of my favorite TV shows on Netflix, even when they're not on the American Netflix. I watch Modern Family that way a lot, for example. Since it's on the German Netflix, I just set my location to Germany again for this, but you could also set it to let's say Australia and watch South Park or set it to the UK and access Rick and Morty or American Idol. This also works with BBC iPlayer and other streaming services, by the way. And it also encrypts your internet connection, which is great when you're connected to a public Wi-Fi network, like at the airport or at a coffee shop. In those cases, I usually just pick the US location and just use it to keep my internet connection safe. If you want to take advantage of all of these perks too, just go to expressvpn.com find out how you can get three months off ExpressVPN for free or just click on the link in the description below. But before you even watch the election outcome today, we should probably talk about how the German election even works and who those candidates are that I mentioned. Of course, there are many great sources out there, even in English about the political system in Germany and the 2021 elections. I'm gonna link a few in the info box below, but I'll do my best to summarize the most important things for you in this video in an understandable way. To do that, I'm going to divide it into chapters. You can find those listed in the info box and they should also show up down here on the timeline. And I'll try to answer all the important questions of what, who, how, when, and so on. Let's start with the basics and some hard facts. The Federal Republic of Germany is, as the name suggests, a federal republic. The US is a federal republic as well, just like many other countries in the world. This means that there are individual states that all belong to one nation, one republic. And the power is divided between the nationwide government, which in the US is called the federal government, and the subdivisions, so the state governments and everything below that. Germany consists of 16 states, called Bundesländer. Besides the governments, we also have parliaments on both levels. Every state has their own parliament called Landtag, and then on the federal level, our parliament is the Bundestag, located in Berlin in this building called Reichstag. I found the term federal diet for it in English, but I'll just refer to it as the Bundestag in this video. In addition to the Bundestag, we also have the Bundesrat that represents the states on the federal level. It's called the Federal Council in English. Both the Bundestag and the Bundesrat are involved in legislation. The Bundesrat isn't elected as a whole though, it consists of members of the state governments. But what we're going to focus on today is the Bundestag because that's what's being elected. And by electing the new Bundestag, we're indirectly also electing the government 
and the Chancellor, who is the head of government. This is because Germany has a parliamentary system, whereas the US, for example, has a presidential system, where the president is both the head of government and the head of state and is elected separately from the legislature. Now, Germany actually does have a president as well, who is the head of state. Currently, it's Frank-Walter Steinmeier, but he has more of a representative function in Germany. You can kind of compare his function to those of the Queen of England. He does have political powers, but they're usually more formalities, while the Chancellor in Germany would be more like the British Prime Minister, so the person that's actively leading the government. The term period for both the government, the Bundesregierung, and the Bundestag are four years, by the way. The last election took place in September 2017. So to summarize the hard facts, today on September 26th, 2021, Germany is electing the new Bundestag, which will be the 20th Bundestag of the Federal Republic of Germany. And affected by that, there will be a new Bundesregierung, federal government, led by the Chancellor. Now let's talk about how voting works in Germany. One big difference to the US is that you don't have to register to vote in Germany. Every citizen over the age of 18 who has lived in Germany for at least three months is eligible to vote and there is no need to register your current information and address for this because everyone in Germany is already registered with the Einwohnermeldeamt, the resident registration office. So you'll automatically receive your Wahlbenachrichtigung, your notification of election, in the mail. Then on election day, you'll just go to the polling location, the Wahllokal that is listed on there, which is often in elementary schools, town halls and other public buildings, and you show your notification and ID and fill out the paper ballot. Or of course, you can request an absentee ballot a few weeks in advance. Another difference to the US and other countries is that in Germany, elections usually take place on a Sunday or they could also take place on a public holiday. This is simply because most people are off on Sundays, especially with stores in Germany being closed on Sundays, and church doesn't really play that big of a role in Germany either. I've heard many Americans say that voting on a Sunday wouldn't work here because people want to go to church. Okay, so that's how the voting process looks like overall for a German citizen. Now let's talk about what we're voting for in particular. So. What does the ballot look like? What are we actually choosing from on election day? So as I said, we're electing the parliament, the Bundestag. More precisely, we're determining the distribution of seats between the different parties. Germany has a multi-party system. And we're also voting for certain MPs, members of parliament, Abgeordnete, directly. It's called a mixed member proportional representation system. Long word, but this is how it works. The German ballot Stimmzettel has two columns, two categories, if you will. The first one is for your Erststimme, your first vote. Here you vote for a direct candidate from your constituency. Germany is divided into 299 constituencies, so this first part of the ballot will look different depending on which constituency you live in. Each party will have one person up for election per constituency, and this is a winner-takes-it-all concept, so the candidate with the most votes will get the direct candidacy for this constituency, which means that they will have a secured seat in the Bundestag. The Zweitstimme, the second vote, is the one that defines the overall seat distribution in the Bundestag. Here we vote for a party. The percentage of votes that each party gets will define how many seats the party gets in the parliament in the end, as long as they receive more than 5% of the votes. This threshold is called 5% hurdle, the 5% hurdle. If a party doesn't pass that threshold or alternatively wins at least three single member constituencies with the first vote, they won't be represented in the Bundestag at all. So overall, we vote some people directly into the Bundestag with our first vote and our vote for the party, the second vote, defines how many seats each party gets. Since the parties announce their lead candidates for the chancellorship in advance, the decision of who we vote for is usually also influenced by who we want to become chancellor or which party we want to be part of the government, even if the names of the chancellor candidates are not actually listed on the ballot. Now, once the German people have cast their vote, what happens next? So again, the percentages from the second vote define how many seats each party will get. Now, by default, that percentage will be out of a total of 598 seats in the Bundestag. 
The seats for each party will first be filled up with all of the direct candidates that they got throughout the country and the rest will be filled up with so-called list candidates from the state lists of the parties, the Landeslisten. Those are lists with MP candidates that the parties have previously nominated internally within the party. The list candidates usually also run in one of the constituencies as a direct candidate, so even if they don't win the constituency, they then still have a shot at a parliament seat through the list. Now, what makes things a little complicated and makes the Bundestag become bigger than it's supposed to be are so-called Überhangmandate, overhang seats. This happens when a party has more direct candidates elected through the first vote than they have seats according to the second vote. Since the direct candidates have a right to be in the Bundestag though, the party would be represented with more MPs than they're actually entitled to. That's why, to keep it fair, the other parties get so-called Ausgleichsmandate, compensation seats, so they get extra seats to keep up the percental distribution from the second vote. Because of this, the size of the Bundestag usually turns out to be much bigger than the suggested 598 seats, which can make decision making even harder. The current Bundestag that was elected four years ago has 709 seats, for example. Now, since the parliament elects the chancellor, the number of seats of the parties decides over which party or parties will form the government and in the end provide the chancellor. Now the polling locations have been closed, the votes have been counted, what happens next? Usually a party will need the majority of the Bundestag seats to be able to elect the chancellor and form the new cabinet. If one party gets more than 50% of the seats, they can form the government. That's pretty simple. In most of the cases though, none of the parties get that many votes, which means that they have to form a coalition with another party. So the government will be formed by two or even more parties and they will govern together. This is why after the election, the parties start negotiating. Oftentimes there is more than one possible option for a coalition. Some parties are a little bit more flexible as to who they could collaborate with based on their political orientation. Others are a little bit more limited in their options. What's important is that the coalition of the parties gives them a majority in the Bundestag in the end. Technically, it's also possible to form a so-called minority government without having the majority of the seats, but that's never actually happened on the federal level before. The negotiations between the parties take place behind closed doors usually and can take weeks or even months. That's what happened after the election in 2017, where Germany didn't have a new government until over 170 days after the election. So it took them almost half a year. During the negotiations, they'll talk about things like which party gets which ministries, and they try to find common ground on policy points that they might have different opinions on. Once they've come to an agreement, they sign a coalition contract, and then the Bundestag elects the chancellor, and the Bundespräsident, the president, then officially appoints the chancellor as well as the ministers. So that was the theory. Now, what could the new government actually look like? What are the polling numbers like? And who are the chancellor candidates of the different parties? So in our current Bundestag that has been around since 2017, there are six different parties and those are probably going to be the same parties that will be represented in the new Bundestag. The first one is the CDU-CSU, CDU slash CSU, which is a union of two parties, the Christian Democratic Party and the Christian Social Party. The CSU can only be elected in Bavaria while the CDU can be elected in the other 15 states. It's kind of complicated, but on the federal level, they usually work together and are often just referred to as the Union, the Union. This is the party that Angela Merkel is in and they've been part of the government consecutively since 2005 with different coalition partners. They're considered one of the big Volksparteien in Germany, the People's Parties, and can be described as center-right on the political spectrum. Their chancellor candidate this year is Armin Laschet. Then we have the SPD, the SPD, the Social Democratic Party, that are considered the second People's Party, or at least they were for a long time and are actually doing really well again now. In fact, they've been in the lead in the most recent polls. They're considered to be center-left on the political spectrum and their chancellor candidate is Olaf Scholz. 
And then there is the Green Party, officially called Bündnis 90 Die Grünen, that will probably gain a lot of votes compared to the last election and will play a key role in forming the government. They can be described as center-left, similar to the SPD, with one of their main focuses being the environment, even though ever since they've been founded in the 1980s, they've become an established party with a broad election program that goes far beyond just environmental topics. Their chancellor candidate is Annalena Baerbock. Then there's the FDP, FDP, the Free Democratic Party, which is what we call liberal, liberal in Germany, but in English you would probably describe their position more as libertarian, so on the political spectrum they're more center-right. On the very right, there is the AfD, AfD, the alternative for Germany, which is the youngest party in the Bundestag. They were founded in 2013 and are probably the most polarizing and controversial party in our parliament right now. They can be described as right-wing nationalists. On the opposite end of the spectrum, we have the left party, Die Linke, which will probably end up with the least votes this election. As the name suggests, they're on the left side of the political spectrum and the party is a descendant of the SED that ruled in former East Germany in the GDR. Now, I didn't mention the chancellor candidates for the last three parties because they're unlikely to provide the chancellor. However, for the first time ever, there was actually a TV Triel, a TV, I think, Truel or something like that in English, instead of a duel, a duel, like we usually have it on TV before the election. So instead of a debate between just two candidates, it was between three candidates. It was between Olaf Scholz from the SPD, Amin Laschet from the Union and new the Green Party candidate Annalena Baerbock. By the way, campaigning for the Bundestag election doesn't officially start until six weeks before the election, which is very different than in the US. Now, when it comes to what the future government could look like, there are actually a lot of different possibilities this time of which parties could probably form a coalition with each other. Currently, we have what is called a Grand Coalition, which is a coalition between the two people's parties, Union and SPD, which might be an option again this time around, but you can also also see that they could have the Green Party join them, for example, so Union SPD and the Green Party, or Union SPD and the FDP, or instead the SPD could form a coalition with FDP and Green Party, or the Union with FDP and Green Party, or the SPD with the Left Party and the Green Party. So lots of possibilities here, and we'll just have to see who will want to collaborate with whom, and which parties can actually come to an agreement in the end. Four years ago, the first attempt of coalition negotiations didn't lead anywhere because the parties just couldn't find common ground, so they actually just ended that, and a different uh, coalition started negotiating afterwards, and that's why it took so long. Now, these are the polling numbers from a few days before the election, which is when I'm filming this, the SPD is in the lead, followed by the Union and the Green Party. The FDP and AFD have about the same amount of votes. What makes this even more interesting is that over the course of this year, each of the three leading parties, so SPD, Union and the Green Party, has actually been in the lead at one point. So it's really hard to predict what the outcome of the election will actually look like. But we'll know more in just a few hours. So this was just a little overview for you guys about what I thought might be relevant and interesting, I had to simplify a few things, so for pretty much everything I said you could probably add a whole book of exceptions and details and additional information, but I think this should give you a pretty good idea of what's happening today. For more information and coverage of the elections in English, I can recommend the content by DW, Deutsche Welle, as well as Deutschland.de, I'll put a few links in the info box, but they will also report about this on American and other international media as well. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you found the video helpful. If you did, let me know by subscribing to my channel and giving this video a thumbs up. And you can also support my channel and the work I put into it by either joining my Patreon family on patreon.com slash uh, you can buy me a drink on buymeacoffee.com slash or you can support me by clicking on the new super thanks button that's underneath the video. You can also find me on Instagram and Facebook and with that have fun following the election results today and I hope I'll see you next time. Tschüss!